This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 349, recorded on August 7th, 2015. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Missed you last week. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I was uh, uh, driving around the area sorting out some car stuff, but now we have we have two good cars and we're all set. And we are set to go on TWIV. Uh, yeah. t- you know, by the way, it is a gorgeous day here. Oh, lovely here too. It's, Sunny skies, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's just a couple of clouds up uh, there, uh, just enough to make the sky look pretty. 27C here, and, and uh, humidity is 44%. I've got 28C and 37%, but pretty close. And I think we're having a clear weekend. No rain in sight, right? Looks pretty clear, yeah. Very good. Also joining us today from Portland, Oregon, Rich Condit. Howdy, everybody. How you doing? Rich. The itinerant virologist. The itinerant virologist, yes. Do you uh, like that title? Itinerant, itinerant freelance virologist. It's good. Virologist at large. Uh, yeah, sure. That title works. You know, whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm all, I'm over titles. I guess so, you, you like Twiv because you uh, are have been on this whole trip, and you had told us, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to make it, right? <laughs> but I think you uh, like I, it. You know. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, this is. Uh, I'm I'm cutting out some other spectacular activities today to do this. So we got uh, 73 Fahrenheit, which is 23 Celsius, and sunny skies. Really nice, nice day. It's been great weather here in the Pacific Northwest for a couple of weeks. It's all good. Uh, how long are you going to be in Portland? Uh, we're going back tonight. This was just a quick trip to visit some sort of extended family. You're going back to the Bend yeah. area. Going back to Sun River for another week, and then we're headed south. All right. The, going around the bend. The adventures. Going around the bend. The adventures of Pox Doc. Yeah, it's just somebody, people, I hope the listeners out there are making a map. <laughs> Tracking <laughs> pins and stuff. You know, speaking of Pox Doc, I had made this short link years ago, bit.ly slash Pox Doc, right, which linked to your... Yeah. You Florida page. Now, you Florida changed its uh, URL, oh. so it's broken. So I went over to Bitly and and asked, how can I change this? And they said, well, you have to become a premium member. Oh. And I said, okay, how much is that? And they said, it starts at $995 a oh. month. A month. Oh. Can you believe it? That's crazy. Wow. So I have to get a, another short link, and then I'll just change all the old ones so we can have Rich Condit back on the uh, internets again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> This episode of TWIV is brought to you by ASM Gap. Turn your science into a company. If you do a really mean plaque assay, why not turn it into a company? If you can go high titers of viruses, turn it into a company. Or even better, if you've made a virus vectored vaccine, why not turn it into a company? Well, this is the meeting that will show you how to do that. It's sponsored by the American Society for Microbiology. It's happening from October 1st through 3rd. And you have until August 20th to apply at asmgap.org slash TSC. And this is the last time we will mention this on TWIV. So if you're thinking about it, now's the time to click on that URL, asmgap.org slash TSC. I would go to this meeting if I could, even though I don't want to turn my science into a company because I don't want to lose money. <laughs> I think it'd still be interesting. I want to tie in, I want to turn podcasting into a company, but that's not what this is about. And this is going to be at uh, ASM in Washington, right? ASM HQ in yeah. Washington, D.C., where the cherry blossoms are long gone. <laughs> so it's safe nice to place go there. To, <laughs> nice place to visit, though. And I will yes. be there next Friday. To uh, do an interview, uh, that's right. I that's will not go to thanks. see. I will not go to see the cherry blossoms. Uh, Alan, we had two. You heard the first week where we heard about who donated the cherry blossoms. I listened to last week's episode too, and there was an erratum so, last week. Yes. Yeah. 
So you're up to speed on the cherry blossoms. I'm, I'm all up to speed <laughs> on the cherry blossoms, yes. So at this meeting, they will have people who have turned their science into a company, successful entrepreneurs. They're going to tell you how they did it and give you tips, advice, and resources on how you can make your startup. That's a short meeting. It's going to be small, a little workshop style. So really, if you always wanted to do this, check it out, asmgap.org slash TSC. So what's the motivation for this? Are we promoting um, translational science, basically? What's the motivation for the meeting? Yeah, why should ASM promote a uh, a meeting like this? I guess it's promoting translational science. Member interest, I imagine. Yeah, member interest. You know, ASM wants to help all of its members, and there has Mm -hmm. been some uh, need for this because a lot of members make interesting uh, discoveries, and they want to commercialize them, so they are responding. They are the members organization, yeah. And other... New York Academy of Sciences did one like this a few years back. Sure. Um, that yeah. they so so different different science organizations hit on this topic, and yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. I also want to tell you about a job at ASM, which you might want to apply for. It's a social media specialist. This is a full time position. It will be in the communications and marketing strategy department. They want a person who's going to be basically coordinating social media for much of ASM. Cool. And they would like someone who understands microbiology. A master's is required. They would love to have a PhD. Should have a couple years of writing experience, have done social media, you know, all the usual ones, Facebook, Twitter, Google, YouTube, Instagram, Wikipedia, et cetera, et cetera. Full-time job, Okay. Good organization, ASM. Very cool. So if you have uh, these um, qualifications, I will put a link in the show notes to this page because it has a very long URL. Um, And you can also uh, email Human Resources, which is an easy email, hr at asmusa.org. But do look at the... uh, the posting, which I'll link to. It has all the stuff that you need. And most important, you have to have a demonstrated ability to set and meet deadlines, which counts me out. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is how to turn your smartphone addiction into a career. Yeah. Yes. And if you love science, Excellent. you don't want to do science at the bench, but you love science, you know, you're thinking about writing, but you love Facebook, uh, so Twitter, et cetera, check this out, all right? And... Um, Social media. All right. We have some follow-up. First one is from Robin. Overcrowding and virulence. Jeans are no longer jeans if they are not blue. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Sorry. Jeans are no longer jeans if they do not survive. Those that do not adapt disappear. An adaptation to high transmissibility with episodic transmission in pathogenic microbes might allow high virulence, as in smallpox, but generally... Decreasing virulence over the long term tends to be more adaptive, trending towards an uneasy truce or even a peaceful coexistence. However, there can be environmental conditions external to both the host and the pathogen that can modulate their interactions. Overcrowding of chickens in industrial farms could promote the transmission of pathogens to a degree that would compensate for the maladaptiveness of an increase in virulence, thus accounting for the increased virulence seen since the advent of industrial chicken farming. Urban overcrowding could be the setup for the emergence of novel human-to-human transmitted pathogens. So this is in reference to last week's paper about the Amerix disease virus vaccine. That's a good point that we have made kind of artificial settings with chicken farms and pig farms and what else, which may alter the way viruses are transmitted, right? Yeah, and yes, I think I, you guys you guys alluded to uh, you guys alluded to this, um, and I was as I was talking along with the podcast, I was commenting on this as well. Um, so yeah, the the timing of this more virulent strain of virus, um, as you pointed out, was was pre vaccine, yeah, yeah, and correlates much better with the rise of industrialized chicken farming, um, which was you know this whole big effort to boost meat production in the U.S., which was very successful. Um, but the way that you do that is that you you 
industrialize the whole process. So it's not Farmer Jones with a few hens and a few cows and, and some ears of corn. Now it's one big, huge shed with, uh, with tens of thousands of chickens in it. Um, and that is quite possibly where this thing came from. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, Alan. Can, I'm sorry, Rich, you should take the next one, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Jim. Uh, Jim writes, this is our friend Jim from Smithfield. We haven't heard from him for yeah. a while. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that session with Dr. Stites. It was so enjoyable to hear such animated talk about big events in microbiology mm-hmm. with insights about the work and researchers for a n- nice long period. Researchers face so many obstacles in their work, including gender discrimination, but you fo- folks offered many positive aspects that made for a pleasant presentation. The sound quality was perfect, too. 345 is easily one of your top 10 productions, Professor Racaniello. <laughs> it was like sitting in on an informal discussion between Feynman, Oppenheimer, Curie, Rosalind Franklin, and Turing. Great minds are beautiful. Thanks again, Jim. Wow. I have to exclude myself from the great mind part, but it was a fun That was that was an outstanding podcast. episode. That's one that really should be I don't know, highlighted on the site or something. If you're just getting into Twiv, check this out. Yeah, she was wanna, you know, the thing was she was positive the whole time, right? Yeah, she yeah. was a yeah. great, great guest. I was yeah. so bumped that I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was really good. Yeah. I wanna I wanna be Feynman. <laughs> you know. Have you ever? I think I've picked some of this stuff. Have you ever read the stuff Feynman has written? You know, I haven't, but I should because he's awesome, yeah. right? I yeah, really it's you, uh, you've very picked, entertaining. All right, I'll go back to the picks and, and buy one. Uh, of them. Surely you're joking, Mister Feynman. Start with that one. It's really interesting. Who would I like to be? Well, I don't want to be touring because he offed himself, right? And right. it's not yeah. good. Uh, he was not a happy man. I don't. Wasn't think. happy, no. but he was very smart. And um, Oppenheimer you could be was fun. not happy. Later, you could be so. Oppenheimer. I could, yeah, be, that's right. I could be yeah, Rosalind that's Franklin, right. but she died too, you know, too yeah. early, way too early. Well, you can be Feynman too. Why not? No, no, you're Feynman. <laughs> that's all right. Maybe, you how about, list, can then. I add the, yeah, could I be um, um, Albert Einstein? There you go. <laughs> In my dreams, right. Alan, can you take George's? Sure. George writes, Hello, Twiv professors. I've been a faithful listener for the last one year, and I have to admit I'm hooked. Every Monday I download the podcast and listen while driving home. Wish you could see me driving and laughing while listening to the discussions. (laughs) I notice that very few listeners from Africa write, besides Pete in South Africa, and I'm certain you have a huge fan base. On Twiv 348, you talked about Nigeria reaching a milestone one year since the last polio case. This is quite commendable. My country, Kenya, has been largely polio-free, except some few introductions from the neighboring countries. However, this progress is now under threat from the Catholic Church. The Church is opposing the polio vaccination, ostensibly because the vaccine is contaminated. This is a dangerous position to take because, as Professor Racaniello noted, these are the same reasons that led to the balance in the polio cases in Nigeria from 2003. I just hope that religion will not be allowed to mix with health. Keep up the great work. I learn more from you each day. And uh, George says, it's rather cold by our standards here in Nairobi, Kenya. 18 degrees Celsius, humidity 50, 56%, precipitation 22%, and wind 11.2 miles per hour. Hmm. And he's in the Department of Medical Laboratory Sciences at Kenyatta University. I hadn't heard about this uh, issue, but I found an article in which the WHO dismisses uh, the church's concern about the vaccine. It's amazing. Yeah, unbelievable. Amazing. So this, um, I'm just waiting for the yeah, the article to come up. Um, yeah, it's slow. So this was this was not um, the Pope. This was not the church no. speaking. No. Uh, um, you know, ex cathedra. Um, this was a local cardinal, yeah. in, cardinal. in Kenya, right? Or in some, Kenya. Yeah. That's right. That's correct. And as I was reading this, I was thinking, man, the Pope ought to step in on this. Yeah. Okay, because you know he would do the appropriate thing. So I mean, he's saying that it's not safe for kids under five, which is totally absurd because that's mostly <laughs> who gets that's it. Who gets <laughs> it? And that's who it's intended for. Yes. Uh, this is very bad. Yeah, but this is actually um, I, I blogged about this a while ago. This is one of the problems that you run into using OPV for the eradication campaign, and they're relying so heavily on it. Um, 
you know, one of the one of the anti-vax uh, Nigerian folks was saying this. Uh, um, they shouldn't give this vaccine. It's um, it's causing polio. And yeah. well, how do you answer that? Because it kind of is, but that's not really the the relevant point. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that may feed into some of this sort of thing. When, and it makes it harder to, to answer that until you switch to IPV. So I do want to point out that this uh, link that's posted uh, that discredits this uh, via the WHO, if I understand this correctly, is a, is a post from a government website. Yes. So the, gov- the government has its act together. Yes. Uh, and they mm-hmm. are working to um, uh, discredit this a pronouncement from the local Catholic Church that uh, the polio vaccination is bad. So that's good. Yeah, right. For sure. All right, our last follow-up just came in a few minutes ago from Ma- Margaret, who writes, this paper just came out in PNAS, and it confirms what Rich said in TWIV 348. The best way to convince vaccine-skeptical people about the benefits of vaccines is basically anecdotes about what happens to unvaccinated kids. Directly addressing... Anti-vax arguments about the risks of vaccines is a waste of time, as we know. It's like playing a game of whack-a-mole. The arguments change constantly, and as soon as you've convinced someone that one argument is faulty, three new arguments pop up to take its place. And often it has the counterintuitive effect of actually hardening anti-vaccine beliefs. Instead, talk to the vaccine skeptical about the dangers of the diseases that vaccines are designed to prevent. That is as Horn et al. show, actually succeeds in increasing vaccination rates. I found it to be a rare piece of encouraging information. So she links to a PNAS article called Countering Anti-Vaccination Attitudes, uh, where they basically uh, look at the effects of um, doing just what Margaret is telling us. Uh, the interesting thing is that I I just had a quick look at uh, at that article. When they talk about uh, providing information about the uh, dangers of the diseases. It's not necessarily just a bunch of numbers and stuff. They're providing stuff like personal stories from uh, mothers whose babies have gotten sick. Uh, they're providing pictures of what kids look like when they're sick and that kind of stuff, in addition to information from a CDC site. site. So this sort of very personal anecdotal approach uh, to informing people is part of the effectiveness of this approach. Yes, yes. This is part of a body of work that has um, that's shown this um, in a few other contexts as well. That in communicating the effectiveness of vaccines and the importance of vaccines, um, the the thing that overcomes the resistance is not the science that we like to rely on. I mean, yeah, that's nice that we can point to the fact that these things work um, and we have the data to prove it, but the data do not convince the people who are not approaching this rationally. And so you have to, um, you have to approach in the same way that they, that they reach the anti-vaccine conclusion, which is emotionally. Yeah. Uh, and importantly about this, one of the things I got out of this is that very specifically uh, spending your time trying to debunk the pseudoscience is that's a complete waste complete of time. waste of don't, time don't 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 even bother yeah how can you tell if some if a paper is open access or not at pnas um there's no obvious statement that usually they say it's open let me somewhere check right this. uh because what here with it this one is not open access it's unfortunate yeah i i um when i looked at it earlier i just I, i've got my password already comes up and I just click through this but yeah. um too bad uh, yeah but this it gives me easy. it gives me the login yeah too bad Vincent you skipped you skipped over a follow up uh yeah Marianne yeah, Marianne yeah. oh we haven't finished Margaret's I haven't finished letter Margaret's. Yet. oh sorry right. sorry yeah so let's get our act together here. all right we'll continue with Margaret's I also wanted to remind Rich that Vermont which like California is quite the bastion of anti-vax sentiment has also passed a law removing philosophical exemptions for vaccination requirements in public schools. It doesn't address religious exemptions, and it certainly doesn't end the battle over vaccinations in Vermont, but it is a huge step forward. 
I have many friends in Vermont, several of whom are immune compromised, and I cheered this news loudly. I wanted to make sure Vermonters get the credit due them for pushing this important and politically difficult move. She gives Excellent. a link to an article in the Burlington Free Press about this. Thanks for your show. I'm a genetics evolution PhD who has moved on to toxicology from my postdoc, but I greatly enjoy getting to sit in on your virology journal club every week. The podcast is a good length for my bus commute, as depressing as that is, <laughs> and it helps me feel like that time stuck in traffic is well spent at least one day a week. Keep up the great work. Well, just to uh, to appreciate the, the bad commute you have, uh, Margaret, I have about an hour commute, but one night this past week it was a horrible accident on the turnpike. And it took me three hours to get home. Oh. Ouch. Yeah, it did. Ouch. <laughs> I was sore. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. And, that's, and when you're driving, that's the worst. At least on a bus, you can, you can read or something or sleep. Yeah, well, I listened to a couple of podcasts, you know. There you go. Still, you three hours of podcasts. Well. Yeah. So my, <laughs> my son, working at Google, walks, uh, a cor- walks a quarter of a mile through a park. To that's, get to that's work, great. that's just great. And then, but he has to uh, a couple of days a week go to, to downtown Seattle um, from Kirkland. So Google, of course, has a <laughs> shuttle bus, right. and of course, the shuttle bus has internet. <laughs> so he just sits on the shuttle bus and does his work while he's commuting into Seattle. Uh, he's going to be very productive in his life, <clears throat> and yep. he'll have less stress. Yep, they're going to help him out. Uh, yeah. Rich, can you take Marianne's? Okay. Mary Ann writes, Hi, TWIV team. I just wanted to follow up on two letters from your last episode. On the controversial anti-vaccine course taught at U of T, the de- that's University of Toronto, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. The dean of U of T, Scarborough, <laughs> has resigned after the internal investigation. The story seemed to indicate that the instructor of the course officially called Alternative Health Practice and Theory who was also coincidentally the resigning dean's spouse. Ah. Right. Uh, I don't know that that's coincidence. Is no longer teaching there, and the course has been discontinued, and gives a link to uh, a news story about this. As for the letter from DJ. um, That's DJ. Okay, this is. I remember that. This was a letter that we had uh, last time. Yeah, well, uh, she goes over this. His letter seemed to indicate that vaccines are so dogmatically entrenched in science that they are static, that they don't change as post-marketing data is collected. In fact, there have been many modifications to vaccines over time, often with an effort to increase safety. A great example is the pertussis, which causes whooping cough vaccine. The original vaccine was and had been associated with an increased, although still relatively mild, adverse effects after vaccination. In an effort to reduce these events, there was a switch from an acellular form to an acellular form in the 1990s. However, this has come at a cost, with data emerging that the immunity in those vaccinated with the acellular vaccine is not as effective as the whole cell. I think you may have covered this story on a TWIV episode. However, link to manuscript is below. All vaccines and their modifications will have risk and benefit. I think that the point is that although scientists are basically unanimous around the value of vaccines, it doesn't mean that they are blind to improvements that need to be made over time. It's just that it's incredibly difficult to explain how and why vaccines may change in today's sometimes very anti-vaccine climate. Scientists by nature speak in nuanced terms, and the public sometimes that is mostly, has a short attention span and an allergy to jargon. Scientists need to be consistent and approachable and relevant. Science outreach is so important. That's why I appreciate the Twix podcasts and all that you do as a group. Cheers, Marianne. And uh, she gives um, a link to, what's this one? It's a paper on the uh, 
pertussis the vaccine. Pertussis vaccine. Ah, potato, okay, paper on the pertussis vaccine. And you stuck in another link here? I oh, stuck the, in, right. Huh. So um, it's not just that we're open to the possibility that uh, currently used vaccines may have issues. The CDC, at considerable expense and effort, actually maintains a publicly accessible database and has done so for years called the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. If someone receives a vaccine and their physician notices that they ha notices that they have some adverse event, which is a fairly broadly defined thing, uh, after receiving the vaccine, they are required to report it to the CDC, and the CDC collects these reports, um, which a lot of them, you know, it's just post hoc. The person got the vaccine, they developed some kind, they broke out in hives a few days later, doctor reported it to VAERS, um, and that ends up in the system. So um, there, is, there is a problem, uh, there, there are some issues with analyzing these data. There are also, there's no denominator, you don't know how many people exactly received the vaccine, you have to estimate that through other sources. Um, but the events themselves, when things happen with a the vaccine, there's a system that collects that information and documents it. And that is all publicly available. And this is um, this is duplicated in virtually every developed country, I think. They're, they're watching this like a hawk. And can be extraordinarily useful in identifying trends of yes. adverse effects. Yes, and in fact, the... Um, the uh, paper that we talked about that stimulated this particular branch of discussion, um, the flu vaccine was tracked in exactly that way. And the reason they knew that people were developing uh, narcolepsy after getting the vaccine was because of a system like this. And there are thousands of such reports. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And in oh, fact, yeah. the anti-vax people always say, look, 10,000 yes. adverse events with the HPV this, this vaccine. This thing gets <laughs> abused to no end, and the CDC tolerates this because they understand that this is an important thing right, to maintain right. and to keep public. Um, but as I pointed out, there are, there are issues with analyzing the data. You can't just point to it and say, look, there are all these adverse events, you have to actually dissect those out. And of course, if you're coming to it with an agenda, you don't bother to do that. Um, but the, the people who should be watching are indeed watching, and they're, they're doing it very closely. Yep. This is great. Thank you for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. uh, because we were not really so good at answering DJ. And it just goes to show that Twiv is a crowdsourced podcast. That's right. Great listeners here. All right, we have a snippet suggested by Justin, who sent us a link to a wonderful Nature article that I, I thought Rich Condit and Joan Stites would really like. I, uh, Justin nearly broke my head with this one. because uh, <laughs> this, is, this is extraordinarily complex, but I, th yes. I think in the end I kind of get it. Uh, it is a paper in Nature called Protein Synthesis by Ribosomes with Tethered Subunits. Yes, there are, there's a lot of complexity here, but there are a couple of main points that I think we can bring out that will make you appreciate this. Now, as everyone knows, ribosomes are where proteins get made in the cell. Does and, everyone really know that? I wish they did. Well, they should. Now they do. But if people okay. listening to TWIV probably know Have we that. done translation yeah. in Virology 101? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. That's right. <laughs> we I think do a Virology, virology 101. 101. May have been the last one we did. Um, ribosomes are in all cells, and they're, they're made up of two subunits. There's a large and a small subunit, and they're slightly different in eukaryotes versus bacteria and archaea. But um, they're made of RNA and protein. And in the cell, the two subunits are separated, and then when it's time to make proteins, they come together on the mRNA in response to a variety of signals, which we have talked about. Now, what these guys have been working on for many years, and these, these guys are from uh, the University of Illinois in Chicago, Northwestern University, um, a, a place in uh, Lyon, the University of Lyon in, in France. They've been doing this for a while because I was looking up the literature. They want to let's be actually, able... Let's actually be specific about who these guys are. First author sure. is uh, Cedric Orell, uh, and then there is Eric Carlson, Teresa Zal, Tanya Florin, uh, and then I guess there are two senior authors, Michael Jewett and Alexander Mankin. Right. And of course, um, 
viruses don't make their own ribosomes, so they're dependent on the cell's translational apparatus. So this has implications for viruses as well, in case you're wondering why we're doing a ribosome story on TWIV. Um, so the, the, these guys have wanted for years to make what they call an orthogonal genetic system for translation. I knew I was in trouble when I couldn't get through the abstract without looking up a word I thought I knew the meaning of. Yes, I spent right. a long time trying to figure <laughs> I out was right. I was right. what they Wait, meant. Ortho- they want it at 90 degree angles to yeah, what? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not the traditional definition the of orthogonal. The second definition of orthogonal, which means uh, un- unrelated to, unconnected to, right. independent. So they want to make ribosomes that would, say, in a cell, be translating just one message and all the other ribosomes in the cell doing their own thing and not be affected. That's right. what they mean by orthogonal. The problem is that the two subunits, if you, if you made an altered ribosome, they would be mixing with this, the ribosomes in the cell, right. right? Now, for the question that people might be asking, why would you want to do that? Um, they give a couple of answers in the paper, but um, the, the most obvious reason is so you can study how ribosomes work. Right. Mm-hmm. So if you muck with a ribosome in even a simple E. coli cell, you kill the cell or you make it very, very sick and you can't figure out what's going on because everything's falling apart because it can't translate its proteins properly. What you'd like is to have the ribosome translating some message in the context of a whole cell. You can get a ribosome translating something in a test tube, but it's not the same. Um, And you'd like ribosomes that are doing that orthogonal to the rest of the translational machinery in the cell and then you can muck with those and see exactly what happens yeah you could also have them do different things from yes the cellular ribosomes and you could cool things yeah you could you could make ribosomes that do stuff that the cell is not capable of doing and surviving right so my i say let them do this because even though we're not sure what's going to come out of it it will probably be incredible and open a whole new field and Yes. Be able to treat human diseases. Who knows? Anyway, so their solution to this problem is we got a large and a small subunit. So in bacteria, you have a 16S RNA in one and a 23S RNA in the other, and they're complex with proteins, right? Their solution was to make a single ribosomal RNA. They joined the 16 and the 23S together. They chained them together. They chained them together. The process of doing that must have taken them a long time because they had to figure out where to chain them together. So they did it by trial and error. And they had right, to and do it. <laughs> they had to do it with an RNA molecule that wouldn't fall apart or get digested in the cell. Right. Mm-hmm. So they it was all trial and error. Made a lot of different constructs. And the key, one of the key reagents here. This is done in E. coli. They have an E. coli strain. This is got to be one of the coolest things on the planet. They've taken away all the ribosomal genes in that E. coli. Ribosomal and there are RNA. several. And they're a bunch, right? And they've now put in a plasmid that encodes the ribosome, ribosomal RNA. The protein right. genes are in the, in the host. So this E. coli grows happily with its ribosomal RNA on a plasmid, and they can use that to introduce altered uh, ribosomal RNA genes. Isn't that so cool? Yeah. So they figured out, they, they joined the two subunits. This is the and, microbial equivalent of an artificial heart. <laughs> <laughs> they figured out where to join these two RNAs together, and they found one or two that worked, which means that when you put the construct, it's on a plasmid, and in an E. coli, you replace that plasmid in, encoding the two separate ribosomal RNAs, the cells will grow. And it works. You can now make, and it's amazing, you now have ribosomes <laughs> that don't come apart because the ribosomal RNA is joined, all the proteins bind normally. And the amount of RNA that's made seems to be more or less the same as uh, in a wild-type cell, according to the gel they show. These cells grow a little slower, right, than wild This was where my head exploded. (laughs) In all three domains of life, ribosomes come in pieces. Right. That nobody's found any organism of any kind where you've got a one-piece ribosome translating. Mm -hmm. And these guys just built a chain of RNA that links the two. So there's got to be some critical reason why this is in two pieces, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, tautologically, you would say, or or teleologically, you would think, well, evolution has some reason for preserving this. Um, And so these folks just 
linked the two pieces together, well, of course that can't possibly work, and it does. It's amazing. It really is. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. It's amazing that they had the whatever it takes to pursue this to a fruitful conclusion. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Grit, so uh, let me tell term. you where my head exploded here because. <laughs> Uh, one thing I didn't appreciate until I got way into this was, you know, exactly how this would be used. And the key to that for me was this notion of being able to target ribosomes to a particular message mm -hmm. in the cells. Right. Yes. So let's say you have a, uh, a, a sequence that, and they use a sequence for a particular secretory protein or something like that, that, that poses a particular problem for translation that you're interested in studying and you want to study that message in particular uh, the way that they isolate to study that message from the rest of the cells is to change the shine del garno sequence upstream from the initiating uh, aug in that message and to change the complementary Shine, uh, shine del garno sequence in the ribosomal RNA for the ribosomes, uh, and this is this is a region of complementarity between the ribosomal RNA and the messenger RNA that allows ribosomes to pick out an initiation site on a messenger RNA. So now you've made a special ribosome that recognizes an altered initiation signal and a special message that contains the cognate initiation signal so that that particular ribosome can recognize only that message and only those ribosomes can recognize that message. So now in the cells with the altered ribosomes and the altered message, you're just looking at that one system. But now the problem is, as has already been alluded to, let's say that the phenomenon, that, that recognition goes on in the small subunit. But let's say the phenomenon you want to study involves the large subunit, say right. peptidyl transferase, where the peptide bond is actually made. You can tinker with the small subunit all you want, but in the context of a cell where you got regular ribosomes around as well, the wild type 50S subunit is going to jump in there, and so you can't study what you want to study. Now that technology exists that you yep. can actually link together the yeah. large and the small subunit so that the recognition brings the special message brings in not only the small but also the large subunit. It took me forever yeah. to get right. that. Yeah, but, it is. Oh. It's not really presented, but that's a nature paper, I think. They make well, this, is a, this is a letter. It's a big letter, yeah. They make you really condense it. They take out all the explanation, yeah. basically, which I well, think it, is, it, is, is, is not really nice, but we But also, it conceptually, conceptually, it's just, it's it's very difficult, among other things. I, I didn't know. I mean, this idea of being able to target a ribosome to a particular message by messing with the initiation uh, sequences, I think that's been around for a while, yeah, but I was, sure. not, I was not aware of it. Okay? By so the way, I, Rich, who discovered this Shine del Garno sequence? Uh, well, uh, uh, Joan uh, was uh, one of the laboratories that figured out that the Shine del Garno sequence was actually responsible for the initiation. Yeah. It is called the Shine del Garno sequence because yeah. I forget what their first names are, but Shine and del Garno were the ones who recognized uh, that actually. 16S ribosomal RNA had been sequenced in a lab, I forget where, and uh, 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 I believe it was, I hope I've got this right, somebody will write in to me, if, write in if I've got it wrong, but I think it was uh, Shine and Del Garno who uh, were experimenting with a new technique for sequencing uh, RNAs and decided that they would use the known uh, three prime end of ribosomal RNA, which had been sequenced uh, as their sort of proof of principle. They could reproduce that sequence. And they did it and figured out that the published sequence was wrong. Mm -hmm. And in the process, discovered this sequence, which uh, I forget whether it was... Um, uh, them or Joan independently or what, uh, ultimately it was revealed that that base paired with this uh, sequence upstairs from the uh, translation start site. Joan then spent a number of years uh, uh, after that doing a number of very elegant experiments to prove, in fact, that that complementarity uh, was what uh, controlled the initiation at the initiation site. John Shine and Lynn Delgarno. There you go. They're Australia. from Australia. Yep. Right. I think uh, Joan would like this paper, wouldn't she? Oh, yeah. She'd love this paper. This is great. So the um, 
And so, so Rich has just told you how you can modify a, a messenger RNA and the ribosome so that they will these new linked ribosomes will just translate that one message. You know, if you wanted to do this in eukaryotic cells, that would be harder, right? Because yes. you don't have a Shine Delgarno in eukaryotic cells. You just have right. a cap, and I don't know. You know, you haven't. You do have internal ribosome entry sites, but that's a different mechanism of initiation. And I, I don't know how you would do this offhand to get a, a specific message translated in a eukaryotic cell. Well, you, you'd start by studying the process with this system in bacteria, and then figure out what you maybe, could get away maybe. with in eukaryotes. Well, I don't know. I think it would be really interesting to know if you could do this in eukaryotic cells as well. If you could tether the two eukaryotic uh, ribosomal right. RNAs. Um, I'm not aware that anyone has removed the genes from a eukaryotic genome and put them on an extra chromosomal element, right? So, but that would be cool. I think that would be a neat experiment. So that is really the the, the crux of the paper. Um, there there are lots of details that are quite interesting, but um, one thing I found interesting that um, I just mentioned briefly: these cells with this uh, tethered ribosomal RNA they they grow about half as fast as wild type cells. And they say they isolated a mutant strain that grew faster, just fortuitously, after passing the, the cells for 100 generations with this linked ribosomal RNA. They got one with, with better growth characteristics. And um, they found two mutations in the genome of this strain. Uh, one in a gene for one of the ribosomal proteins. So one of the proteins that's bound to the ribosomal RNA called S1, which may be the RNA, maybe the confirmation of this RNA is different now that you've linked them so the proteins aren't fitting quite well, and that's what this is all about. So I'm sure they're going to follow that up some more. Gain of function. Yes. Do they say that in this? Uh, yes, they do. I thought they did. Page yeah, they 122, used. we next demonstrated the evolvability of ribot by selecting the gain of function mutations in the peptidyl transferase center. All right, our ribosomes are going to get stuck together now. <laughs> Gain of function. Another example of the utility of such work. <laughs> yeah, so they had uh, this, this sec mRNA, which you alluded to, Rich, that kind of stalls. Uh, it's problematic for the ribosome. So that, right, that's, and, the, and all the problems are associated with the large subunit. Yeah, and so they have to deal transferase and the acceptor site and that kind of stuff. Yeah, so they evolved ribosomes uh, that could deal with that. So this is very cool. I yeah, think beautiful this is paper. It's beautiful. Uh, it builds on a lot of work, and that's really the theme of today, that uh, yes. any, any paper is not just existing on its own. They all stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, this uh, has been these guys have been doing this for years, and lots of people, including Joan Stites, Shine Delgarno, and many others, have contributed to this. Great stuff, thank you, Justin. Yes. All right, uh, the paper we selected for your listening, commuting, exercising, working pleasure. That was just a snippet. Now we get to the yeah. Papers. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes there isn't much of a difference, but right. <laughs> we used to just do two papers. Now we. Now we oh, do. Now we try and make one shorter. This was published in uh, the Lancet on July 31st, and it is efficacy and effectiveness of a recombinant VSV vectored vaccine expressing Ebola surface glycoprotein interim results from the Guinea ring vaccination cluster randomized trial. Now, if that exploded your head, we will <laughs> explain it to you. <laughs> a lot of words up there. And this is, uh, well, the first author is Ana Maria Henao Restrepo, and the last author is John Arn Ruttigan. This is a study carried out in Guinea. Uh, WHO is part of this, University of Florida in Gainesville, apparently their biostatistics department. You know, Did you yep. know that they have a great biostatistics department, Rich Conde? Of course, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> University of Bern. In Switzerland, Cape, the University of Cape Town in South Africa, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, Porton Down in the UK, Public Health England, mm, Hamburg, Germany. So this is a big, and, and there's more. I haven't gone. Belgium, Norway, uh, Baltimore, 
Uh -huh. I haven't counted them up, but there must be over 20 authors. It's a lot yeah. here. And uh, I would like to point out that uh, the last two authors, this is a co-senior author thing again. Mm -hmm. They say the last two authors, uh, Marie Paul Keeney and uh, John Arn Rittigan, are contributed equally. Okay. All right. I, so this is the result. This is an interim result of, the, of a, an infectious attenuated uh, Ebola virus vaccine, which is built on a vesicular stomatitis virus background. And before we get into the actual results, I wanted to just spend a few minutes talking about uh, how this vaccine was made. Because uh, as Rich had mentioned uh, earlier in this week or last week, there's some sense that this vaccine was just developed in the past year or so. And I want to dispel those notions by saying that this vaccine... Its origins can be placed in the 1970s when we, not we, but when virologists discovered reverse transcriptase, when recombinant DNA technology was developed, and when sequencing was developed. And shortly after that, it was shown that cloned DNA copies of several RNA viruses, a bacteriophage, a retrovirus, and poliovirus, when put in a plasmid, were infectious. So you could take a DNA copy of an RNA virus and get virus back. So that is really the early... Well, you could go all the way back to learning how to grow viruses. And you cell could go back further, course. yes. You but could that's... go back further. But I think that is the as far back as you need to go to, to say that facilitated this work. Um, in 1995, Jack Rose and his colleagues at Yale University showed that you can recover uh, infectious vesicular stomatitis virus from a cloned DNA copy. And VSV, of course, is a member of the rhabdovirus family. It is an enveloped, bullet-shaped, uh, negative-stranded RNA virus. It is and impor importantly, it uh, is in the same order as Ebola. So if you look at mm. its genetic structure and the fundamentals of its life cycle, it is very similar to, uh, to Ebola. So right. uh, the notion of swapping out uh, an uh, envelope structural protein from VSV for Ebola seems, at least on paper, pretty straightforward without necessarily tweaking the biology of the virus all that much. So in that paper, uh, the Rose paper of 95, at the end of the paper they say, because VSV can be grown to very high titers and in large quantities with relative ease, it may be possible to genetically engineer recombinant VSVs displaying foreign antigens. Such it has not escaped our notice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Such modified <laughs> viruses could be useful as vaccines conferring protection against other viruses. Actually, if we're, and if we're going to talk about uh, uh, the, the larger history of this whole thing, I think I am correct in saying that the concept of recombinant viruses in general and the idea of uh, recombinant viruses as vaccines for foreign antigens in particular, I believe, arises from working with vaccinia virus, the smallpox vaccine. I think that's one of the first viruses that was engineered in this fashion and, the, and studied as a possible vaccine vector, and that was in like the late 70s, early 80s. So that's a while uh -huh. back. Okay. Was that using recombinant DNA also? Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. All right. So in 2004, about nine years later, a paper was published in the Journal of Virology where they used all this technology to make actually a recombinant VSV with, and they actually made several, carrying various uh, glyco glycoprotein genes from various phyloviruses, both Ebola and Marburg. And they showed that these replicate very well. So they either replaced the glycoprotein of VSV with that of a phylovirus or added the phylovirus uh, G, G protein gene. These viruses replicate very well. Uh, when you inject them into mice, they induce the formation of neutralizing antibodies. And then if you challenge the mice with Ebola virus, they're protected. So, you know, taking the Jack Rose statement and doing the work, and this was actually done in Canada. It was uh, work funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. And over the next 10 years, this, these, these viruses, these recombinant VSV Ebola viruses, were used in a number of studies um, in Canada and then in the U.S. at Rocky Mountain Laboratories in particular, an NIH laboratory, uh, where they 
showed that these recombinant viruses could protect non-human primates from lethal Ebola virus vaccine. So there are a number of papers done, some of which we've talked about before. Uh, they also studied the vector itself, the VSV vector, in a lot of non-human primates to make sure it didn't have any adverse effects. And they found that these vectors, um, when put intramuscularly into non-human primates, they they induce protection against lethal disease, <clears throat> they prevent viremia, and they are really only transiently uh, shed from the animals with minimal side effects. And uh, going forward, although in the 2004 paper they make a couple of different constructs, as you mentioned, one of which uh, substitutes the VSV envelope glycoprotein with the Ebola envelope glycoprotein, and another in which is just added in. Going forward, the virus that is uh, used in these trials and has been studied most extensively is the one where it's the substitution. Right. So this right. this virus lacks the VSV envelope protein and instead has substituted the Ebola Ebola envelope uh, glycoprotein. And otherwise, right. it's just regular old VSV, which uh, I was a little surprised at this because there's also running sort of in parallel with this been a tremendous amount of research done in uh, developing potentially safer versions of yep, this yep. virus because there's always uh, a safety issue with uh, live vaccines in general and right. recombinant vaccines in particular. And so there have been a lot of different vectors that have been engineered of VSV that are attenuated to varying degrees. Uh, but uh, in this trial, at least going forward, and I, I don't know why, maybe it's because this particular recombinant was uh, more developed at the time. They went forward with um, the one that's just regular old VSV with the Ebola virus glycoprotein right. spliced in. <clears throat> So this, uh, sorry, this recombinant virus was originally developed in Canada. A company uh, called New Link Genetics um, licensed the technology, and then they signed an agreement with Merck uh, in 2014, and Merck has been producing uh, the virus for subsequent use. Now, in August of last year, uh, Canada donated 800 vials of this vaccine to WHO. They established what's called the VSV Ebola Consortium, and the job of that consortium is to conduct clinical trials. So they did a phase one uh, in uh, Africa and Europe, and these were published back in April uh, in New England Journal. Uh, and, and phase phase one, to remind people, is just a very small trial, safety trial to make sure safety trial. So this was 158 adults. Uh, there were four different parts of this trial. There were three open label dose escalation trials to figure out. Uh, how much to use, and one randomized double-blind trial where you don't know who gets what. 150 adults, each person was given uh, anywhere one injection IM of either th up 300,000 or up to 50 million PFU of the virus or placebo, and they just looked for vaccine-related events. Nothing serious. They did see some fever, joint pain, and a little bit of vesicular dermatitis, which this virus uh, is known to cause in people. They got antibody responses in anybody, in everybody, and some, most of these were uh, neutralizing as well. So that was a phase one, and you know they skipped phase two. <laughs> well, this this gets to what I think is really, for me, the at least the crux of this paper. How the heck do you test a vaccine like this? Mm -hmm. And this comes up, this is not unique to Ebola. I'm actually working on a story right now for Nature Medicine about chikungunya, um, which the same thing comes up there. It comes up for any uh, disease where you get outbreaks of it and epidemics, and then they burn out and go away. Mm. And the problem is, okay, yeah, we want to develop a vaccine against it. Um, we think we know what the correlates of immunity are. We think that antibodies will be protective. So let's develop a vaccine that is safe and that causes people to generate antibodies, well, that's nice. How do we know it really works? Uh, well, we can wait for an outbreak to occur, but if we didn't vaccinate people before the outbreak, then we don't get any information. If we go and we just vaccinate everybody in areas where there are likely to be outbreaks, then we've just got to wait around for an outbreak to happen. And how many people are you going to vaccinate in order to be in the right place at the right time? And it's a real problem uh, throughout this field, especially for um, what are called neglected tropical diseases, 
where you've got stuff that the, there's not a lot of motivation for companies to put huge sums of money into this. There isn't an ongoing case population of the disease. Um, and I think the solution that they came up with, and I gather they came up with it just for this trial, is, I think, extremely clever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they skip phase two. They go right to a phase three. It started in March of this year. Just And these were just published, which we just referred to uh, in the Lancet. And this is uh, open access. Great. That's really the, good. In fact, <clears throat> all I think all of the Ebola papers that we're talking about, the, that Vince had just referenced, the phase one and all that, the New England Journal of Medicine papers, uh, those are also open access. And the Science Express report uh, with the macaques is also open access. So it's nice that they've done that. Good. So this is called a cluster randomized trial, and it's, it's modeled on ring vaccination, which was an approach used for smallpox eradication uh, in the 70s. And, you know, this is perfect, actually, for this situation. Here we've had an outbreak, and it's waning, so what do you do? In ring vaccination, basically, you see a ca- for, for smallpox, they would see a case of smallpox, go in and immunize around the case, basically, hence the name ring. Everybody who contacted that person and the contacts of the contacts. Right. Get that. right. Primary and secondary contacts of the right. index case. And, uh, you know, Don Henderson, who D.A. Henderson, who is the architect of that for the smallpox eradication, I interviewed him last year, and we talked about this and how he came up with this. It's really cool. So here they use the same approach. They say, okay, uh, in Guinea, there's not a lot of Ebola, but when there's a case, we will go in, identify the contacts and the contacts of contacts, and then, and that'll be a cluster based on that infection, we're going to randomize whether people get immunized immediately or whether they get immunized three weeks later because they didn't want to do a placebo, right? right? They, they didn't think that was ethical, I presume. And yes, so they just they, they did, cited ethics for that, and they just delayed infection uh, vaccination, and then they monitor these people, and the end point is Ebola infection confirmed by PCR, uh, and they wait at least ten days because um, anything before that could have been acquired uh, earlier. So these individuals who were immunized, they get two times ten to the seventh PFU intramuscularly, so one shot. Uh, either immediately or three weeks later, and then they just follow these individuals. And the clusters are of varying sizes, and you have a bunch of them. So you're doing yeah, a bunch right. of, instead of doing one big clinical trial trying to vaccinate everybody in Guinea and then seeing what your rates are, you're you're doing a bunch of little tiny trials. That's right. That's why it's clustered, because you have one outbreak, one case here, and it's ring. And then if there's another case somewhere else, that's another cluster. That's another cluster. And that's how you get around the the fundamental statistical problem here because you're running so many concurrent little experiments that together you can then take the data and get a statistically meaningful result. Right. I think it's brilliant. So the total number of um, people – so we're talking about 4,000 roughly immediate immunized group and 3,500 delayed – Right. Um, now, for a variety of reasons, they would identify contacts and contacts of contacts. Not all of them were, were ended up being eligible for a variety of reasons. You know, they were too young or they had other issues right. that and, prevented, yeah. right? So, in, and these were all contacts or contacts of contacts. So, actually, they did have a placebo group, Right. They had these individuals who were identified as contacts or contacts of contacts, but couldn't be immunized for some reason. Right. That served as their placebo group, even though it wasn't planned that way. So the numbers are really all in table two. If you want to look at this paper, I spent about two hours looking at this table because <laughs> it's a bit, it's a little bit complicated the way it's presented, but. I'd say the first column is is very important, and these are all the people who were vaccinated of this eligible group. 2,014 people were immediately vaccinated, and 2,380 had vaccine three weeks later. Okay, Then there were some cases at less than 10 days, but those are discounted cases of Ebola because those uh, were acquired 
probably long before the immunization. The key is the number of cases at 10 days or greater. The immediately immunized people, remember 20, 2014, zero cases of Ebola. Whereas in the delayed immunized group, 16 cases. And they, according to their formula, that is 100% vaccine efficacy. Well, not according to their formula, just according to basic math. You had zero in the immediate vaccinated group after after greater than or equal to 10 well, days. Therefore, it's going to have to be, if you got any in the delayed vaccination group, you're going to have to reach 100% uh, vaccine effectiveness. But because this is a statistical sample, you you have a confidence interval around that 100 or below that 100. Um, so it's, it, it's not... Uh, the the reports on this were it's 100% eff- effective, and of course it's not exactly what the paper is saying. Right. So the the problem is that the table says 100%. Yes. And the press says, oh, it's 100%. Many articles were the headline is Ebola vaccine 100% effective, right? And it is technically true that in this paper they got an efficacy of 100%. But you have to think about what's behind that number in order to appreciate that that's probably not yeah. the case. Well, here's the problem. In this particular group, which you either got immediate or delayed vaccination, yes, they got zero cases in the immediate versus right. 16. Presumably those 16, they got them because it took longer for the vaccine to kick in, right? Didn't have a chance. So that's a good measure of the efficacy. Um, the problem is that there's this other group. I'm going to go all the way to the right on the table, yeah. where they had a whole lot of people who were eligible. 4,123 were eligible, but they didn't immunize all of them. And I think, in fact, 2,000, um, 2000 and some, 2009, 2,109 if you subtract the 4123 uh, to 2014 from the 4123, 2,109 did not receive vaccine, but they were contacts or contacts of contacts, and they were eligible. In that population, they got eight cases of Ebola. In the immediate, right. In the, well, they were supposed to be immediate, but they weren't immunized. They were, right. right. Some of them were immunized, but some of them were not for various reasons. Yeah. That's your placebo. Or it's not a placebo because they didn't get anything. That's sort of your placebo or your control population. So that's not a lot of cases. In other words, aren't that many Ebola infections going on here? Right. And that's the concern with this, that it's a relatively small number, even with all the different clusters. Uh, but in the absence of immunization, you still only got eight cases. So you would like to have more, obviously. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of the data, you'd like to have more, obviously. So the, but the problem is that as it stands, you know, if the FDA were looking at this, they wouldn't license this vaccine because there's not enough statistics here to do that. There aren't enough cases. They wouldn't license it if you were recommending it as a universal vaccine for all kids to receive over six months or something like that. But... Um, and not only is it only, I mean, you point to the eight there, but the number underneath it, I think, is also quite significant. Um, so in the immediate group that could have been vaccinated immediately, and a lot of them were and a lot of them weren't, you had eight cases of Ebola. Yeah. Um, they all were in the ones who hadn't received the vaccine within that subset. And then in the delayed group, um, you had people who could have received the vaccine at three weeks and, and didn't. Um, and the, the grand total there is 21. So not only are the numbers small, but the skew is the same between the immediate and the delayed. There are more in the delayed group yeah. getting this. Um, and it suggests that there may be other issues at play here and that the numbers are so small that you're hesitant to draw robust conclusions from it. Exactly. That's the point. Right. So, I mean, the, so I think that if you see 100%, that's a little misleading because it's not that right. good. There's still issues with it. Nevertheless, the vaccine review board that was uh, running this trial, you know, this is an interim step in the trial. It's not over yet. So at an interim point in any trial, you have to have a decision whether you're going to keep going. You know, you have rules. Uh, right. Whether you're going to discontinue or continue or whatever. The board at this point said, you know what, this is really good. 
we're going to continue the trial, but there's not going to be any more randomization. Everybody's right. going to get a vaccine right away. Right, immediately. And the other thing is, even if you take the pessimistic number from this and you say, okay, let's look at the all contacts group, even the ones who didn't get the vaccine, um, you still come out with an efficacy number of 76%. Right. Which ain't bad. It's very good. It's very good. The only question I have was if you had an outbreak where you immunized, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of people, would it still be that or would it be 50% or less? You know? Well, I think this highlights another advantage of this approach to the trial. This is most likely the way you would deploy an Ebola vaccine. That's a good question. That um, is a very good question. And, I'm not and sure. Again, getting Well, I think it would be. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you immunize... Uh, entire at-risk populations. It's because the entire population is not equally at risk. Yeah. Who gets this disease? The caretakers, the people immediately in contact with the patient. And so for maximum effectiveness, especially in areas where you've got major infrastructure problems and staffing problems, um, you're going to go where you're most likely to have the most effect, and that is going to be a ring containment strategy. I don't know. I think that first off, you'd hit all healthcare workers, right? Yes, you, sure. you would start. Absolutely. You would start well, off by lining up all your healthcare workers and vaccinating them. But right. after you've done that, I think you'd go around and find cases, and then vaccinate contacts and contacts of contacts. But of course, you're going to miss some. Of course, you will. Right? So yes. you can see by the delayed immunization cohort here that you know. If you got some people incubating that you don't know about, you you could miss them. You could, but then when they get Ebola, you're going to do their contacts out to two degrees as well. So, Rich, do you remember whether the ring strategy was used towards the end, or was it used throughout? I mean, my my recollection is that they decided at the end that for resources consideration, uh, they did a ring because they didn't have enough money to keep immunizing everybody. I don't remember. I would have to look that up. But that it was, was part that of that was a, my part of, too. It was yeah, part so. of a larger strategy that could that uh, uh, included not only the ring vaccination, but a, a, a big component of the smallpox eradication campaign was the was the surveillance. And one of the one of the great things, in a way, about smallpox is that because both the disease and the vaccination leave a scar. Mm. Yeah, right, right. All you had to do was, uh, you didn't have to ask people whether they'd had the disease. You right. didn't have to ask people whether they'd been vaccinated. You could tell by looking at them. Yeah. It's amazing. One, one and of the so, you did, so you didn't bother with those people, right? One of the issues here uh, is how durable the immunity is, right? Right. So if you decided that you wanted to immunize, say, everyone in a in a at-risk area, and I would say at-risk is is a place where We've had numerous outbreaks already, right? So these countries and plus other, other countries in Africa, it may not last that long. So it may right. force you to use a ring-type approach depending on the duration of immunity, right? Yeah. So they can take these some of these individuals who have been immunized and bleed them in a year or two years or whatever and, and see if the antibodies are, are still around. But the other thing is that we know from experience in Africa, from what from what's happened in other places where Ebola has broken out, if there's a proper long term response to this, and healthcare workers get training in how to handle a case of Ebola, and they know when to suspect it, um, you can reduce secondary infections with it to zero. Yeah, I believe Ethiopia did that, and that's just a training issue. It's not even a vaccine issue. So. You wouldn't necessarily, I, I'm not sure that you'd ever get to the point where you're universally vaccinating people against this exceedingly rare disease. Mm. Um, but so if, you, if you have an outbreak, then you go in and you do this type of strategy. So, Alan, uh, you've been looking at this and uh, writing about it, so maybe you can address uh, this question. So they've decided at this point that uh, given the apparent efficacy that they're seeing, that it is no longer ethical to delay vaccination to some of these groups, and yet you right. say the trial is ongoing. So that's a, that, that's a different kind of trial in a way. You're, I mean, you, you no longer have a control group, is that right? You no longer How have the you, your, your controls are now the people you're not able to vaccinate. Right. So, so you okay. only have... So it's more like a... 
what we had different names for these sorts of uh, studies. It's, a, it's an open what open? It's uh, an open um, a single something. Uh, yeah, open, there's open a, label. Open label. Right, but it's it's um, everybody's getting the same thing except for the ones you can't reach. Yeah, so um, it's no longer blinded. Right? So it becomes. Um, it's no longer randomized. It, yeah, yeah, it does. It does slightly undercut the. Um, ability to to assay the effectiveness of the vaccine. However, um, I, now that we have this baseline of data, I'm not sure that we care that much. Right. Yeah, that's right? sort of Because the... if you're if you've got a vaccine that is this thing is good. It's at at worst, you know, it's it's pretty good, and at best, it's really good. Um, as long and, as it translates to bigger numbers, right? Right. So, so you've got this, and this plus containment strategies would be the way to combat an Ebola epidemic. Um, and I think realistically, in the places where this virus is breaking out, especially in this huge outbreak that we've had now, um, you can't go in and vaccinate everybody against anything. Because if you could, we wouldn't be talking about the difficulty of eradicating polio, right? Well, I would say that, you know, let's say there is, in, in a year, there's an outbreak somewhere in a country. I would not just do the contacts and contacts of contacts of that first case. I would want to blanket a greater area, because as we've seen in this outbreak, it pops up all over the place within a country, crosses borders. So, If you could. You know, if yeah. you could. I, I would say go in, vaccinate your healthcare workers, and do the ring containment. And then if you have resources left over, then by all means have the drive-in the drive clinic and the this and that and go and vaccinate other people. As far as we know, from as far as we can tell from the phase one and, and this trial, um, this is a pretty safe vaccine. They're, yes, not, seeing, yes, they're not seeing any deal breakers. I think it's important to point that out. Yes, for sure. Um, so the risk is very low. The risk with catching the virus in this case is extremely high. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think if you have resources left over at that point to dedicate to the vaccination, then yes, broaden it. But if you don't, which is quite likely going to be the case, then I would say focus on this ring containment strategy. Uh, I think that without the placebo control or whatever, it becomes, I'm, it's a little subtle here, an observational study. Um, okay. I'm, I'm looking at a wiki site on types of, uh, on clinical trials. Okay. But uh, actually an observational study in some context implies that you don't do anything. You just look right. at people. Okay. Uh, so this is an interventional uh, study, but without controls at any rate. Fine. Or with only with only found controls. Right, right, right. Anyway, it's uh, pretty neat that this all it's started incredible. in the 70s, and now we yes. have a recombinant virus vaccine that seems to be pretty good. And, um, you know, this. I know that people were working on this for years and never thought it would get licensed. Um, this was originally made for the military and yep. for researchers. That was mm -hmm. the original idea. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm often very critical of um, biodefense-related research, but obviously when you then take it and move it beyond that, it can be really, uh, really rewarding. So well, that's and a there's, great example. And there are virtually identical stories for other viruses. Sure. Um, as I say, I'm working on this story about chikungunya, so I've got that on my brain right now. And, the, and one of the things I came across, people are working on a vaccine against it because it's now spreading to many more countries. Um, and uh, but I, I noticed that there were these papers from the early '70s where they did all the way through I think a phase two trial of a chikungunya vaccine mm. at Walter Reed, and then interest faded and the whole thing got shelved. But the science behind it has continued to move on, and so yeah, sure. now people are able to pull all that off the shelves and say, "Okay, can we make uh, can we make a vaccine against this?" and here you go. And I think with this, you know, you've got people tinkering around with, gee, can I make an infectious clone of this virus? And, and now um, you can pull all that off the shelf and here you have an Ebola vaccine. And so I just want to make a plug for basic research again. Absolutely. You know, please don't, don't mess with it. 
So I got a couple of more comments. First of all, on the topic of um, controlled trials, uh, I want to remind people of a paper, that a tongue-in-cheek paper from the British Medical Journal that I think we've <laughs> talked about before, yes. entitled Parachute Use to Prevent Death and Major Trauma Related to Gravitational Challenge, <laughs> colon, a systematic That's review great. of randomized controlled trials. And they are, in a satirical fashion in this paper, making the point that uh, in some cases, it's obvious what the advantages are of an intervention, and you don't need to do a randomized trial. In this case, the, uh, the, uh, it's parachutes. I mean, you're not going to do the controls there. As a matter of fact, in this paper, they uh, uh, suggest that a controlled trial be done and that uh, the volunteers should be from amongst the crowd who insist on there being controlled trials. They're going to be the controls in this experiment. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is this whole concept <laughs> of recombinant vaccines with recombinant yes. vectors. Because... Uh, now, there are a number of recombinant, so I will define a recombinant vaccine as something where using recombinant DNA technology, you have altered the genetic composition of a virus to be a, a virus vector. That'll be the replicating part and sometimes non-replicating. It just allows you to grow it. Um, uh, and and uh, uh, you've recombined into that an antigen that otherwise would be foreign to the original vector. So you have this recombinant, uh, a, uh, a vector that delivers uh, a foreign antigen to uh, a subject for vaccination. This is a concept that's been around for 20 or 30 years. I think there's been... I don't know. My sense is that there's been reluctance to do this in humans, and uh, there's there's been uh, there are uh, quite a number of recombinant vaccines that are used in uh, veterinary circumstances. Uh, the just as an example, the rabies vaccine that you might get for your cat is probably a canary pox with a rabies glycoprotein spliced into it. Uh, but there have been there have been trials with uh, recombinants in humans. Uh, there was, a, in fact, another canary pox expressing the HIV glycoprotein that was part of one of the HIV trials. Um, and we saw recently a trial with a camerivax vector. That's the yellow fever virus background expressing the dengue uh, envelope uh, genes. Uh, that had some success, but the only recombinant vaccine that is licensed for use in humans, and it's not in the U.S., I can't remember exactly where it is, is the same Camerivax platform uh, expressing glycoproteins for Japanese encephalitis virus. And it's used somewhere in uh, uh, in Asia or something like that. I, I, I forget. There's only one licensed recombinant vaccine. There are several others uh, in trial, and it interests me as part of this whole thing is that now we're seeing a lot more interest in this as a uh, potential technology for vaccination. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the next decade or so we see a lot more of this recombinant uh, vaccine technology. Yeah. Now, the term recombinant vaccine is also often applied to things like virus-like particles. Yes. Um, so if that, you... That's not what we're talking no, about. No, that's not what we're talking about. I just wanted to clarify that because right. the I think the official product name for Gardasil includes recombinant. Um, and yes, so that is a, that's a recombinant vaccine because it's virus-like particles expressed in, I think, yeast cells. Um, but it's not a virus that is uh, that's going to go in as a recombinant virus. Yeah, probably the better term is something like recombinant viral vectored vaccine. Yes. Yeah, because the something recombinant like comes from recombinant DNA in that yes. one case, right? Mm -hmm. And in actually making a recombinant virus in another case. So a little confusing there. Yeah. Well, there's going to be more of them going forward, that's mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Not just for vaccines, but for gene therapy as well. Yeah. Yes. All right, let's do some email. We have a, a one from Lance, which is very related to what we've been talking about. Lance yeah. writes, Dear all, in approximately two weeks, I will be headed to the CDC lab in Sierra Leone for two to three months to help with the Ebola effort. Working for the CDC viral special pathogens branch is something I dreamed about when I was a wee little microbiologist and sitting in my cubicle across from people who I've read about in books and science articles is really amazing. 
two thoughts. One, I have been and probably will remain quite critical of the PhD postdoc system and training. I didn't have a great time doing my PhD and found it difficult to get employment that I could survive on immediately after. However, I remain flexible and have since had a couple of good jobs followed by the CDC calling and offering me my dream job. So keep your head up, stay flexible, and apply to everything. Two, I think the TWIV crew should come to Sierra Leone. I don't personally know yet, but I've been told that the hotel is quite nice, and supposedly we have Wi-Fi most of the time. (laughs) I'll keep you posted on the weather when I get there, but it looks hot, humid, rainy, and floody. Looking forward to curling up after a long day in the hot lab and listening to TWIV from inside my mosquito net. Best wishes, Lance. TWIV 400. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, Twitter 400 is Sierra Leone. Oh, by the way, I meant to point out that I just looked up the Ebola sit rep while we were uh, talking. Oh, yeah. And last week, there were only two cases. Yes. Uh, I think it's, uh, I forget how they were distributed. Must be none in Sierra Leone. Is that right? I, I forget. But there were only two cases. So that's as low as it's ever been. Yeah, since this started. And uh, hearty hearty congratulations, Lance. That's great. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Take the next one, please, Alan. Ralph writes, Howdy, I've been listening to your podcast for about six months. I'm a computer scientist, not a virologist, and I enjoy learning about some other fields. As I expect is the case with a number of others, I first found you when you were doing weekly Ebola coverage. Well, we've gotten away from that. Um, One area where I have not understood your strong reaction was when you talk about gain-of-function experimentation. I get that the whole group thinks the restrictions are unproductive. I have not decided how I come down on this issue. I probably lean towards allowing scientists to experiment just on principles. But there are at least two significant reasons I can see limiting this research, at least government-funded limitations. First, first, there has to be some risk that the experimental viruses could get out. Catastrophic collapse of buildings or terrorist actions come to mind. Second, whatever function you add to the viruses would represent the experiment and may never arise in nature through random mutation. The second factor would seem to limit the potential benefit. I don't see that you give any credence to those factors, and that makes me think you may not be properly balancing risks and benefits. It's currently 85 degrees Fahrenheit here in Dallas, Texas. I don't go for those funny French units, but I think it's fi- it's fine if you like them. <laughs> Said like a Texan. Thank you, Ralph. Um, so, uh, my my position on this gain of function thing, at least, is there are safeguards that are in place already. Uh, this is research that is not undertaken at a whim, and the containment systems that are in place. The evidence that we have is that they work um, because you're not seeing plagues wiping out humanity. Um, So the other the other argument that I have that I think I pointed out on TWIV is if it were possible for viruses for a particular virus to develop some adaptation that a made it vastly more virulent, and B made it incredibly successful as tran- at transmitting as a pathogen. And hopefully, if you're listening to Twiv, you understand there's some conflict between those two goals. Um, that would already have arisen. And the fact that we don't see it happening in nature, I, I mean, when somebody gets a flu virus infection, they produce all possible combinations of of mutations that you could get in that virus. It's a very mutagenic process through multiple rounds of replication. And the virus has seen fit to um, to maintain its current level of virulence, which is, you know, not good, but it's certainly not wiping out humanity. The, the idea that humans are going to somehow produce this super virus and makes a nice movie, but it's pure hubris. We're not going to do anything that the virus hasn't already done. I just I find that very hard to believe. I also should point out the um, <clears throat> with respect to this catastrophic uh, collapse, the needle, if we remember, and you should go look at the video threading the needle, it's a concrete box within an outer building, and that concrete is like 12 inches thick or something like that. Yeah. So if the outer building collapsed, you'd still have this inner shell with all the viruses in them. I think it would be really unlikely that that is going to come apart. I think whatever force could take that building down to the extent that the uh, that 
any pathogens inside it could actually be released is going to be incompatible with any of those pathogens surviving. And the rest of Boston as well. Yeah. Um, now, the idea of somebody deliberately spiriting something out of the lab or accidentally, um, that I think actually has some credence. Sure. And that's why there are so many layers of security and people have to get background checks and yada, yada, yada. And as we saw most likely with the 2001 anthrax attacks, um, even that is not perfect. But I hasten to point out that that was a strain of bacteria that was developed by our own biodefense complex, <laughs> most likely, um, which was more or less your basic anthrax, just with some, some careful preparation. I, w I would say that these scenarios are pretty rare, right? The likelihood that they are going to happen is very slim. You know, slim. So I, th the way we think, or I think, is that you don't want to limit potentially very beneficial research by these scenarios that are apocalyptic and very rare. As far as the, and I think Alan's addressed the viruses. Uh, really well. These things would have arisen if anything we're making uh, were really, really that dangerous. And I think most of the mutations we introduce into viruses to endow them with properties that we need to study debilitate them in some way. That's what we have seen over the years that these experiments have been done with other pathogens that aren't as dangerous and don't inspire fear. So we really have balanced the risks and benefits. We think about this all the time. Um, his uh, uh, his second his second point here, uh, whatever function you add to the viruses would represent the experiment and may never arise through in nature through random mutation. That would seem to limit the uh, potential benefit. Um, you know, I think a lot of the stuff that we learn doing science is by uh, creating things that are you know off the mainstream in nature and seeing seeing what the. Uh, you know how they behave. Okay, testing, yeah, sure. uh, test, testing the boundaries. I mean, the the ribosome paper that we did is a great example. I mean, Alan pointed out yeah, that, uh, that there's never arise. been <laughs> <laughs> there's never been a, a one RNA uh, ribosome. Okay, and yet uh, you you can make that happen and get uh, ex and they did gain of function experiments with it. <laughs> all right, <laughs> and uh, you can gain benefit from those experiments. Okay, so yeah, that's a good point. They may they and in fact that may have arisen at some point. And it just went away because it wasn't very good. Yeah. But I think everything. Oh, yeah. if, I think everything arises in nature. We just never see it. Right, so if I was thinking earlier that if you took that uh, coli that they created with the uh, weird ribosomes and uh, threw it outside, it yeah. wouldn't have a chance. No, yeah. wouldn't have a chance. <laughs> Just like the mice, I, I made gain of function mice years ago by giving them a poliovirus receptor, and people were all worried that they would get out and populate spread the world. Po spread polio. Yeah, they're wimp mice. Have you ever seen how slow a lab mouse is compared to a wild mouse? They would not last a moment. Well, and even if they did get out and breed, the gene has no advantage to the mouse in nature. It's going to get totally diluted out through breeding. Yeah. Nevertheless, it's not, I had to do things that of course. were really onerous. But which you did, I did them. Which I did. And I, and I remember, uh, you know, working in the lab, we had wescodine and all, uh, iodine and all of the uh, <laughs> vacuum traps, and we... we uh, hazardous waste bagged everything and and you know we're working on a virus that everybody in the lab and and in the community was already vaccinated against but these were the procedures yeah, we did it uh rich when you t would you take the next one please uh johnny uh johnny writes great minds so this is high noon on pluto this morning i thought of sending in the nasa link as a listener pick good pick uh, and she has a picture, uh, I guess, from her office or something of the Boston Custom House, Boston Custom House, at uh, high noon on Pluto. That's from uh, Johnny, our physician friend in uh, Cambridge. We picked this on the on the Joan Stites episode. I did, yeah. Yeah. That was. I think she sent this in the same day. Yeah. <laughs> high noon on Pluto. You can take the next one too, Rich. Now, which time zone on Pluto was that? <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, Jack Scrow writes, Hello, Professor Racaniello. Yesterday, I started listening to the TWIP podcast. Entertaining. <laughs> I'm also through lecture 14 on the 2015 YouTube virology course. Thanks for the free and fun TWIV and lectures. In TWIV 2 polio, 
Wow. You mentioned you mentioned people with Ebola get serum from already cured Ebola patients, and the antibodies are sometimes able to cure the symptomatic patients. Must the donor and the recipient have matching blood types for Ebola serum to not be rejected by the recipient's immune defense? Uh, also, if a person is vaccinated with rabies, hep A, B, yellow fever, etc., then is it possible to infect another person with antibodies produced from said vaccinations via unprotected sex? My doctor didn't know. Okay. So, uh, 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 typing with a serum, uh, that's not necessary, correct? That's right. There's no, right, there's no there cells. Because no cell. there's that's no cells. Serum is. And these are human antibodies, so they're all, be happy, we're happy with them. If you put mouse antibodies into someone, we'd make antibodies against right. them. Good question. But it good, is. Qu- excellent question. Yeah, yeah and in, and in fact, that's a major reason for putting in serum instead of just transferring blood is that you eliminate the blood cells. Yeah. And I'm not. Uh, the I'm not understanding the second question. I, I think what the what this person is getting at is if you've been vaccinated against uh, something, um, would you spread your antibodies to another person through sex? And the answer, um, if you were vaccinated some time ago and it, and or it was a killed vaccine, I would say certainly not, because what you have are antibodies, not the virus. Right. If you were to receive a, uh, a vaccine that's an attenuated um, virus, such as the uh, oral polio vaccine or, um, uh, give me another one. Um, measles vaccine. Measles, there we go. Um, and you are actively replicating the virus at the time you have sex, then you could potentially transmit the, the, because that's a live virus, you could potentially transmit it to the other person. It wouldn't even have to be sex. Um, So, in fact, that's a a known mechanism of transfer of attenuated vaccines. But then you'd be transferring the vaccine, the vaccine virus, not the antibodies. And Um, it really would, I'm not sure that, any of the vaccines that we currently use would be sexually transmitted except, well, you know, the HPV vaccines are given intramuscularly. So and I, that's not alive. That's not that's, a live it's vaccine. It's not a live vaccine, and I don't think it's going to make it into the sexual fluids. So no, no. I'm not sure if he's worried about the antibodies or the virus that is the vaccine virus, you know. But in either case, the answer is no. The right? answer is no. Um I mean, there are there are mechanisms of transmission for an attenuated vaccine, and that's called secondary vaccination. But this is not any kind of a risk, certainly, and it's and it's certainly not the case that you're going to um, magically become of a vaccine delivery mechanism after you've been vaccinated against something. Yeah. All right. Uh, but mothers do pass on antibodies to children through nursing. That's correct. Good point. That's correct. So that's, for that's sure. a mechanism. That's a good reason to nurse, actually. Yeah. Especially for rotavirus. Yes. All right. Uh, Martin writes, talk about this. He sends a link to an article uh, about <clears> – <throat> this is a clearly an anti-vaccine site. Oh, God. And the, the, the article is called, Polio Wasn't Vanquished, It Was Redefined. And this basically says that in the 50s, the definition of polio was redefined – to go from paralysis for a day to paralysis of, for over 60 days. And, and the article says, this is why we've eradicated polio. We've just redefined it. No. So this is silly because anything that's transient is not polio. If it just lasts a day, it's not polio. The definition of polio is a permanent paralysis. And that is done on purpose because there are, for example, acute flaccid paralysis, which is transient. It's not caused by polio. And even more importantly, uh, since the 50s, we diagnose polio not just on symptoms but on isolation of virus from cerebral spinal fluid or stool. So you know polio virus is there and it has caused the paralysis. So this has certainly not resulted <laughs> in the eradication of polio. Um, we know it's out there and has been eradicated by vaccination. 
Yeah. So this uh, this publication that he's citing is called the Vaccine Reaction. It is published by the National Vaccine Information Center, These which bozos. is a uh, they, which it's is an anti-vaccine anti-vaccine organization of long standing. They're yeah. right. They they That's, churn out this sort of crap all the time. Yep. Yeah, you're wasting your time reading this. So, stuff. so you know what the thing is? They take something that on the surface seems legitimate, right? The redefinition of yeah. the case. And then they twist it around, and then it's, these are the same people who abuse the heck out of the VAERS system. They'll it, this is <clears throat> this is agenda driven propaganda. It has nothing to do with science. Um, and actually, I've been thinking um, that we've been last episode we talked about uh, the uh, efforts to bring polio in Nigeria under control. Yes, uh, and we and we talked about the fact that they had it almost under control, and then there was a vaccine scare that generated some anti-vaccine stuff, and it uh, it came back. Yep, and now they brought it under control again. So here's an ongoing, yes. uh, right. really nice demonstration of the relationship between uh, the prevalence of disease in a society and their efforts to vaccinate. Uh, yep. It makes a really yep. good experiment. All right, let's do two more. Uh, Alan, you can take the next one. Okay. Um, Susan. Oh, Susan, there we go. I think this is relevant to episode 343 or so, Snippet on Chronic Wasting Disease. And this is, um, yes, this is good. It's a paper. <laughs> this is great. Assessment of Abilities of White-Tailed Deer to Jump Fences. We and had so a discussion as we were discussing we the deer prion disease yes. about how big a fence you how needed big to a fence keep the deer out. To, to stop the deer, and here <laughs> is your answer. And this is why we need all branches of science working on things like this. So these are <laughs> wildlife biologists. They, um, they took wild-caught deer, which they penned in with various fences, and obviously they had some bigger fences on the outside, I guess. Um, but they tested their ability to jump progressively taller fences and they found if your fence is less than less than or equal to 1.5 meters there was zero percent deterrence they were all able to clear that and then at the far end uh 2.4 meters so that's about an eight foot fence i guess that's uh a little, that's a little less yeah. uh, that was two two meters would be six feet yeah. uh, and four seven something uh, we documented 100 percent deterrence rates. Um, 2.4. Yeah, it's about so, it's about eight feet. Yeah. So about, an, about an eight foot fence, and in in the middle you've got these intermediate rates, and they don't say. I assume they used a type of fence that would not impale the deer, but somewhere in there is going to be the range of fence where the deer tries to vault over and but, and gets stuck. If you sort of interpolate between these two middle numbers, it looks like that on the order of half of the deer can jump a six-foot fence. Yes. That's amazing. Yes. Yeah, I got a six-foot fence, and it's not good enough. That's not good enough because half the <laughs> well, deer are coming over it. <laughs> Here's what you need, Vincent, 2.4 meters. No, I, I already – you know, I, this fence was very expensive because it surrounds <laughs> our property, which yeah. is two and a half acres. And damn, the deer just – like we have a garden, and I looked the other day, and they're just munching on the tomatoes. Yep. Well, I told you the other solution, my my father's solution. You get a dog to go inside the fence. Yeah, that's right. You know, our dog got in a fight with a deer a couple of years ago, so we don't we don't like her to go out there. I mean, the deer was like smacking her head with its uh, hooves. And <laughs> it's lucky she didn't have her head cracked open. Pretty, you need a bigger dog. Pretty aggressive. Yeah, this is like a thirty-five pound dog, not too big. Uh, let's, the last one is oh, for you, Susan, Rich. Susan, by the way, is a wildlife epidemiologist. Oh, yeah, uh, in Fort Collins. Collins. Yeah. Hey, we were there last year <laughs> for ASV. Thank you, right. Susan. Wow, we have all kinds of people listening. Yes. Twiv, this is awesome. All right, Rich, take the last one, please. Uh, Christoph writes, hello, Vinny and the Twiv team. No doubt you have already been told about this, but if not, you should check out the recent Rationally Speaking podcast, episode 137. Uh, they have Mark Lipschitz on should scientists try to create dangerous viruses. <laughs> I would recommend the podcast series generally as they speak about many interesting topics. This episode was not as good as uh, not as good as usual, mainly because Mark was not a particularly great speaker. 
I might have skipped it, but felt I had to listen to it, seeing as I'd heard you guys, and Gal, of course, talking about the gain of function brouhaha at length, and I figured I should hear the other side. I would love to hear Vincent and one of the other TWIV hosts give the other side to rationally speaking listeners. I would be happy to email them suggesting you as a guest if you would rather not do it yourself. Mark even mentions TWIV, not by name, just by allusion to a certain other podcast that has subjected him to an to ad hominem attack. Still listening and enjoying TWIV? Keep up the good work. Cheers, Christoph. I don't think we've subjected him to ad hominem attack. You know, that is the tactic of someone who really doesn't have an argument by saying we're attacking them personally. I, I have not attacked him personally, um, as far as I know. I, we've, we've brutalized his argument, but that's entirely different. That's fair game. Isn't that the first time he said that? He said this on another, I think, a science interview. He said we, we did ad hominem attacks. No. In it. And again, it's a tactic to deflate from the fact that he doesn't really have an argument, which he's been perpetuating. And I will not listen to this episode because it's nonsense. Look at the title. Should scientists try to create dangerous, <laughs> dangerous viruses? viruses? This is who's, ridiculous. Who's trying to create dangerous viruses? This yeah. is a PR job on his case to try and do something which is irrational. If yeah. you want to suggest we go on, that's fine. But I ain't going to suggest it, and I would not listen to a podcast that had Mark Lipsitch on it. <laughs> Unless he was talking about something else. But he's welcome on TWIV to give his, uh, his view, right? Sure. Sure. <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> we would not make ad hominem attacks, but we no. would just say why he's not right. I really dislike this attack on gain of function. I think it has no place. He's he's going to ruin science, and I'm very, very unhappy. And I don't even do the kind of stuff he's worried about. I'm just, I'm just worried for science in general. Okay, let's do some picks of the week. Alan, what do you have for us? Okay, first of all, there's a listener pick coming up in a in another email that I had actually had in my Twiv picks folder, but I'm gonna I'm gonna let that be a listener pick. Okay. Uh, it's coming up below. We didn't do it yet. Yes, yeah. it's coming up below. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yes, that's cool. So, and it's it's a very cool one, but I'll let them have that. So, my pick is a um, uh, an exhibit at the National Air and Space Museum that I have not been to. I've been to the museum, but I haven't been to this exhibit. Um, the website is awesome, though, and this is called Above and Beyond, and it is uh, uh, looks like a really, really cool thing to go to. But you go to the website and just scroll down and... <laughs> Cool things Watch happen. what it does. Cool things start happening, yeah. and, and you can you can tour through this. Um, and when you get to the top, it it brings the site in and, and gives you the information about the exhibit uh, that just see. opened, beginning of August, and it's running through um, beginning of January. So I'm I may get down there sometime in December if uh, I, I it, it would be neat to go to, but um, right now may not honestly be the best time because it's. You know, school's out, and it's August, and it's DC, and it's the Smithsonian, and uh, it's going to be absolutely mobbed. But um, but if you go, let me know how it is. And this is apparently going to be a touring exhibit. It's, uh, after well, uh, opening in Washington, it's going to go to St. Louis, and then Seattle, and then London. I'd go to this. Outstanding. That looks uh, great. Go yeah. see, I wouldn't see cherry blossoms, but I'd go see that. You'd go see that, definitely. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, so this looks that, the, that opening thing is really cool. Yeah. I like that. Rich, what do you have? Okay, so I discovered, actually this is another feed from my wife. Uh, I discovered this uh, thing I didn't know about before, the Deep Space Climate Observatory, yes. acronym DISCOVER. And I gave, uh, I looked at a number of different sources to describe this and settled on the wiki link. You can go to the original stuff at NASA if you want. But this oh, is a remarkable machine. So this is a, basically a telescope, an observatory that is parked a million miles out from Earth at a position that is uh, called a Lagrangian point. Lagrangian point, yes. So this is a point between two large bodies where the gravity from each one cancels each other out. So there's a point 
actually there's several of these, but the one that's being used between the Earth and the Sun is a point where uh, you know there's really zero the, the 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 gravity from the Sun and the gravity from the Earth cancel each other out. So you can put something out there and just park it. And they've stuck this observe stuck. They've uh, flown this <laughs> observe. How did they do this? They flew this observatory out there, and the purpose is to monitor space weather, like solar flares and uh, uh, surface emissions from the sun that can influence uh, activities on Earth. Uh, the way this came to my wife's attention was a thing she uh, saw in the Huffington Post that I've uh, linked here. I think I got a, uh, a NASA feature, yes, where... Just as an aside, one of the things that this uh, telescope took was a picture of the moon um, crossing in front of the Earth from what for us is the dark side of the moon. Yep. Okay, so they've even published a little GIF uh, that uh, uh, shows this thing crossing the Earth. I just thought this was fantastic. So you so put a satellite out there to watch the Earth, and the first thing that happens is it gets mooned. Yeah, it's right. <laughs> This has a great history. It was originally... It was proposed by Al Gore. Yeah, and then yeah. Bush, uh, George W. Bush canceled it. Congress asked the National Academy of Science if it was a good project, and they said yes, so it went forward. Can you imagine today Congress asking the National Academy of Sciences what they yeah, think about they something? I thought something was a good idea, yeah. And then it was on the, the Columbia mission that blew up. They took it off just before launch. And sent it up. Yeah, and it time. was launched by uh, SpaceX. Wow, this it was is launched cool. by SpaceX. Nice. So, does your wife uh, give you things because you know you do pics, or just to to do science stuff? Both. Both. So, but she I knows. I mean, she's. I, th I think she knows. She knows that she knows there's pic potential in this stuff. So yes. she knows all about pics. Oh yeah. Has she ever <laughs> listened to Twiv? I don't think so. No. I'm so sad. She's. She's. Well, she. You know. She hears more than she wants to from me on a normal basis yeah. so i think you know, I would she's not going to waste her time listening to me i think i would have to uh <laughs> i think the same applies to me actually <laughs> alan what uh, i already got alan i got rich got am i uh, it's me now it's you yeah, it's you all right so my son uh is in college he's going to be a junior and he's majoring in cybersecurity. Good so field. when I come home and I sit down during the summer, he's around at dinner and he always says, he tries to teach me about security. You know, he's asked me, talked about ciphers and uh, hashed passwords and entropy and all this stuff. And last, the other day he said, Dad, you know what Stuxnet is? I said, come on. It's the thing they put in the uh, Iranian centrifuges, right? And he said, okay. So he gave me a couple of articles it's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Stuxnet is an amazing thing. Of course, it was a, um, I guess you could call it a virus that got into the uh, Iranian centrifuges and disabled them. Uh, but it's now open source. He showed me the website where you could download it, and people are modifying it. And who knows where it's going to pop up next, you know? It may even attack us and disable power plants and so well, forth. It's a little outdated now. It is outdated, but, you know, people can update it. Uh, but there's a Wired article from last year that's pretty cool that explains, you know, how it works. Which is excerpted from a book right. about the, the subject, apparently. And then there's a video also, if you don't want to read and you want to look at a video, which was all sorts of graphics that kind of explains it. And it's pretty amazing what you can do um, with software. So that's the consequence of Aiden Stuxnet. It's, it's a virus, so it belongs on This Week in Virology. So check it out if you haven't yeah. read about it. I think it's cool. Uh, so who made this thing? Ah, well, that's the Originally. question. So yeah, according no. to the YouTube, it could be Israel because it's got references to uh, things that suggest that, or it could be the U.S., but I don't think uh -huh. it's known, right, Alan? Right. I, I don't think so. Yeah. And it, it it is pretty clear that this was created by a state, Mm -hmm. This was not some that, hacker in his basement. This this was a serious, dedicated effort by people with some resources. Right, a big project. It was a big project. So this this could be Israel, could be the U.S., uh, it could be a com a combined effort by a few nations. But I don't think that there's any definitive answer on that. Right, and there probably won't be until fifty years from now when it gets declassified. Mm. 
We have a listener pick from Conrad who writes, Hey Twivom, I'd like to share a listener pick with you all. Stated clearly, a collection of animations that explain the basics of evolution and genetics to lay people. I found them useful and easy to understand introductory videos, and I hope you will too. They're also raising funds for new videos. Check them out here. So they're at statedclearly.com slash videos. Those are I watched a couple of yeah. these. I watched a couple of these. They're they're quite good. Yep. Cool. And I, and, I, and I'm really impressed with the motivation of John Perry, the artist and founder, and his team for doing this. I'd, as far as I can tell, they're you know, not getting anything out of it, right? Yeah. That's I mean, right. it's just a volunteer effort. They're doing it because they think it's the right thing to do. Yeah, I think it's that's, that's a good thing. That's, you know, Alan had started something similar a while ago with his Lego videos, right? Right. Just one of the yeah. Yeah, good. much, much, much smaller project than this, yes. though. These, these uh, the, yeah, these guys are putting a huge effort into this. Yeah. It's very well, very well researched, very well done. Yeah. All right, thank nice, you. Nice job. Thank you, Conrad. That will do it for TWIV 349. You can find it at twiv.tv at iTunes, and you can grab it with any podcatcher app on your iOS or Android device. If you have questions or comments, please send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Rich Condit is our itinerant emeritus virologist from the University <laughs> of Florida at Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, great time. Alan Dove can be found at turbidplaque.com. He's also on Twitter uh, as Alan Dove, right? Yes. Thank you, Alan. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>